popular conception that Darwin more or less invented the theory of evolution. He, he went to the Galapagos Islands, he you know, travelled around the world, he made all these observations and he came back and he thought about it for a few decades and then out of nowhere he, he came up with this theory. Of course that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact a lot of these ideas were floating around a long time before Darwin um, was born and what he was doing was creating a, a synthesis if you like, a very successful synthesis, but um, a synthesis of these different ideas uh, into something that, that obviously worked and did revolutionise revolutionize what we now call the biological sciences. And you mentioned that Henry Cheek wrote about his thoughts on evolution, but sadly died. Were there any other people who were writing about evolution with the intention of publishing? <laughs> well, I should mention, I should have mentioned before that in fact, Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, was, had also came up with an evolutionary theory back in the late 18th century as well. And this was actually quite a well-known theory. And people in Edinburgh were also aware of that. So. It wasn't just these French sources that they were drawing inspiration from. In fact, Darwin's own grandfather uh, was also an evolutionist and his, his work was known to people like Robert Grant. I'm telling you, there's actually a very, there's actually a very famous person who, who, who actually claimed that Darwin had plagiarised him. There was, a, there was a man called Patrick Matthew who was actually a fruit grower and he wrote a book about growing timber for naval purposes, I think in the early 1830s, who... Um, in the, in the appendix to his book, he actually outlined his theory of evolution by natural selection, but hardly anyone read it because it was in the appendix to a book about naval timber. Darwin almost certainly hadn't come across it, but when Darwin published The Origin of the Species, Matthew wrote to him and said, hang on a minute, you've stolen my idea. Look, it's here in my, in my book that I published 30 years ago. Darwin wrote back and said, okay, yeah, it is the same idea, but I, had no, I didn't know about it because I'd never read your book. And also... It's just like one little footnote, more or less, whereas I've written this whole big book about it. <laughs> it's almost certain that Darwin didn't steal the idea from, from Matthew. And also, it's, it's also true that, as, we were, as we've been saying, differential survival, these changes in the characteristics of populations of animals was, and plants, was, it was a fairly um, common idea at the time. So that's fascinating that the idea that would change the face of scientific discourse was in the appendix of a book about timber. Hmm. He just didn't think it was that important. Um, in fact, I think he said to Darwin, he, thought, he just thought this was sort of common sense and uh, he didn't think it was a big deal. When did the ideas in Edinburgh surrounding evolution start to shift towards Darwinism and away from Lamarckism and Joffrey's ideas? Oh, that, was, that would be much later. Um, I mean, Darwin's Origin of Species wasn't published till 1859, so um, it would certainly be after that. I couldn't actually tell you which Edinburgh professor of natural history was the first one to adopt um, Darwinian evolution. But in fact, there was a, a kind of a period as well when things go a bit quiet as, as well. There's, there's this period when a lot of people are talking about evolution in, in the 1820s, mid-1820s, really through to the early 1830s. And their interest kind of dies down a bit after that. You don't find so much evidence of it. Possibly because a lot of the key figures who are interested in this kind of stuff have either, either moved on. Robert Grant goes out to London in 1827, for example. He becomes a professor at the new University College London. Sheik dies. Robert Knox, who I haven't mentioned before, was probably also thinking along evolutionary lines at the time. He certainly did later on. He was another professor at one of these extramural anatomy schools. He was involved in the Burke and Hare case. You know, the, he was buying the bodies from them. And um, so he had other things to think about other than uh, <laughs> evolution for a bit. And then it actually, his career went downhill rather after that. And he ended up moving to London as well later on. So a lot of these people, they, they just they just died or moved on. And, um, and there didn't seem to be a new generation of evolutionists uh, taking over from them. 